Not enough coffee this morning. The sermon outline should say at the top, from the lowest steps to the highest height. And this is a text that is very well known if people know anything about Christian faith, uh, stories of the Bible. This is the story of uh, a man named Saul who persecuted the church, coming to faith in Jesus, becoming a champion of the church. But this isn't just another story talking about God stepping in and turning a bad situation or circumstance into a good. This was something that rippled and would come to define God's work in gospel proclamation and his kingdom coming. And it was not according to plan. When Jesus had walked the earth with his disciples and he was going from town to town teaching and healing and bringing deliverance in his name, ultimately leading to the cross, he would talk about this kingdom that he was bringing. He would talk about what this was like. It wasn't just a ge geography. It wasn't just some place to look and to pursue, but it was, it was a positional reality for those that would become citizens of it. It was a behavior that would exist presently here and now. And there's a couple of scriptures that I want to bring to mind. And I, and I do this because I want to, you know, sometimes unmet expectation is just a hard, hard thing to continue to keep our hand holding on to God's. And sometimes it feels like God is holding tighter than we are his. And praise God for those moments, right? But one of the things I'm reminded of in the Old Testament was a king, uh, Uzziah, who was an incredible king in his surrender to God. And God had blessed and moved in his life in such magnificent ways that it overflowed into blessing uh, the nation of Israel. But he didn't end the way that he started. And in his descent from God, taking his eyes off of God, he, he crossed a line that brought discipline from God. And he ended his life outside of the nation that he reigned over outside of the throne that he sat on and in this moment of national mourning and just how did the story go so wrong isaiah comes before the throne of god he comes to worship and god opens his eyes to see beyond the earthly throne of david to see the eternal throne and isaiah is reminded that there is an ultimate reality that is breaking into and no matter the up and the down the success or the failure that is still sovereign that is still coming into, and that is still going to be the forever tomorrow that all things are working towards. And that encouraged Isaiah to continue to go forth and to proclaim to a nation that would drift away from God, the truth of God's word. And I think as we look at the early church be becoming now refugees, being scattered, being hunted and persecuted, there was a lot of unmet expectation when Jesus said, I, my kingdom is coming and giving his disciples power and authority. I'm sure they were thinking that this was going to play out a lot differently than what it was and how it was. And, and, and being reminded of this throne room setting is what Jesus did through the Gospels. He showed us so that we could remember that he is sovereign and in control, and this is his kingdom. And if it doesn't match up with our perception, our desire, or the way that we want it to be present in our circumstances, we need to be okay with letting that go and embracing what he shows his kingdom to be. And Jesus, when he would talk about his kingdom, he, he said this, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not of this world. Jesus emphasized that multiple times. My kingdom is not of this world. What I represent, where I come from, what I am bringing will not be found in any part of this world. It is coming, but it's not here. It's not present. Jesus would also say that not just the geographical sense of his kingdom, not present, not of this world. But he would talk about the behavior of this kingdom. You're not going to find it. You're not going to find it outside of him. Listen to what he would say. Peace I, live with, I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give. Let not your hearts be troubled. Neither let them be afraid. So what Jesus is offering his followers as he's preparing them for what's going to happen to him and being subtracted from them, he's going to give them peace. But it's not going to look like anything that they could receive in any other part of the world. The, the Roman Empire exercised a peace through militant strength. See, there's this kind of peace that comes when you have such power and authority, you can cripple and, and fight off and persecute what is not compliant. See, that's not the peace Jesus is talking about. He's not talking about a kingdom that where people are are delivered from this servitude and placed in this servitude to where people over here are saying yes to the to the to the leader for the sake of their lives 
just being brought into God's kingdom to have that same relationship with God that we're just saying yes to God so that we can have our lives. It is a freedom that transforms us into citizens of his kingdom. It transforms us into citizens of his kingdom. And this, this will make a little bit more sense as we look at what's going to happen here with Paul. But one other passage I want to look at, talking about being transformed. God's kingdom isn't just a regional reality. It is a behavioral reality. Blessed are the peacemakers, Jesus said, for they will be called the sons of God. Blessed are those who, who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you when others revile you, persecute you, utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. And rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Yeah, I know that's great encouragement, right? But what Jesus is saying is that being positioned in my kingdom is going to transform you. It is not a servitude that you go from being a slave here to a slave there. There is freedom through this deliverance, and you are transformed to behave as a citizen of my kingdom. And you are going to be peacemakers. It's not the peace that's found in this world. It's not the peace that's going to find reconciliation through the sword. It's a peace that comes from the power of God's kingdom alone. And this is what leads us to what the reality of what Jesus did on the cross. That is what bridged us and God. And relieves us, delivers us from being slaves to the kingdom of this world to being free citizens of God's kingdom. See, when Jesus hung on the cross, we need to understand what happened. And an entire lifetime, to stand and reflect on the death of what God did on the cross through Christ, a lifetime isn't enough. But what happened? Because of sin, God had judged sin. His wrath is appointed to pour out and remove sin from his creation. When Jesus went to the cross, he was without sin. This is very significant for you and I, because when he went on the cross, he bore the wrath of God over sin for you and I. It is the complete wrath poured out against sin as a totality upon Christ, the righteous for the unrighteous. And what happened when God's wrath met his son, it broke him and grace flooded out. Grace flooded out for you and I. That's what happened on the cross, summed up. Jesus endured the wrath of God against sin so that we could hear the words forgiven. Jesus cried on the cross and said, Father, forgive them. He wasn't just talking about the people who had a hand and part in leading him and putting him on that cross. But all, it is a forgiveness that drove him to be broken for grace to come through. How do I know this? Listen to these passages in scripture here. And then we'll, we'll jump into our text, I promise. Listen to Colossians. It says, Colossians chapter 1. Paul, who we're going to be looking at here, he wrote, he was delivered, he has delivered us from the domain of darkness, and he has transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. See, that grace that was accomplished on the cross is what frees us from the dominion of this world, and it positions us into the kingdom of heaven. It's forgiveness. It's forgiveness. That is the foundational reality that everything that our lives with God grows from. We are forgiven because of what Christ had accomplished on the cross for you and I. But it goes further. And it says in 2 Corinthians, uh, listen to this, starting verse 17 of the fifth chapter. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us this ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespass against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are his ambassadors of Christ, God making his appeal through us. Now, therefore, we uh, uh, implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And what is, what is Paul saying in this, in all of this, and why are we talking about this before Acts chapter 9? Because it's not just about Saul. See, God doesn't want us just to obey him. He wants us to love him and serve in obedience out of our hearts. Ananias is going to be asked 
to do something that was outside of his own strength. See, Saul isn't the only one who experienced a new reality of the forgiveness that would come through Christ. Ananias was going to receive an empowerment to extend forgiveness. Forgiveness touches every part of the story. And I think sometimes we disconnect that and we look at just what God's doing with Saul and we tend to disconnect. Well, I did this. This is what God told me to do. So I'm okay. I did this. I went to church and I listened. I prayed and I sang. I gave. I signed up for this. I did my part. But is our heart being transformed? And, and that's what God's after. See, the kingdom of God that we are a part of isn't just declaration. It's demonstration, and it's a demonstrated heart because that's what God has changed in us, right? The stone is gone. It's a flesh. It beats to the rhythm of his. And, and so I, I'm hoping that this message encourages, encourages all of us as we walk out of here. Am I in love with God? Am I walking with him? And it, is his commands to me a joy? Yes, Dad, I'm going to go do that. What else do you want me to do, Dad? And it'll be hard. And he's going to stretch us. And he's going to grow us. But we have to be willing to continually allow our love to mature. And that's what brings us to Acts chapter 9. Now what's happening in Acts 9? If you missed last week, I want to encourage you to go back to it. Philip is just on fire and is yes to Jesus. He is saying yes to everything that God is asking him to do. And God had led him to, the, to this back road to be the, the invitation to draw closer to God through Jesus Christ. The Ethiopian eunuch placed faith in Christ was baptized, and the message of the gospel would go forth. The regions of Samaria are having this significant revival. Word has reached the apostles who are underground in Jerusalem, and you can bet that word is also reaching the temple authorities and Saul, was persecuting the church. To this point, Saul's persecution has been within the boundaries of Jerusalem because you don't need a lot of permission to take care of cleaning your own house. It's when you want to go in your neighbor's house and change things up that you need authority, right? And so Saul's looking, and he's seeing what's going on in this region of Samaria, and he, he's learning that many saints, followers of Jesus, are fleeing to Damascus. And so he wants to go there, and he appeals for authority to be able to go and to bring those followers of Jesus in chains back to Jerusalem. Listen to this. Saul, chapter 9, verse 1, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, he went to the high priest and he asked him for letters to the synagogue at Damascus so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. What is he referring to? What is Luke talking about with the way? Jesus said, and it's in your, your notes, so definitely there are a lot more scripture in your notes than what I'm going over because I want to invite you to walk through the thinking journey that I had with the Holy Spirit. If you want to dig deeper in God's word, navigate those scriptures. This, that's the journey, a snippet of the journey the Spirit took me on this last week. But Jesus said, I am the what? Way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me, outside of me. It is not possible. And so people that follow and place their faith and found the grace of God and forgiveness in their lives are walking and referring to this as the way. It's the way to God. And so Saul is identifying followers of this movement by the term the way and he wants to go and he wants to persecute them He wants to bring them back and it's funny because later on in life He, he, he appeals to believers that I did not come with letters of authority or endorsement, right? See in the kingdoms of this world You need the authority, but citizens of God's kingdom the authority goes with you Because it's in you you don't need the letters, the endorsements, the name of Jesus goes with you. And it's interesting how we look at Paul's old life and how it plays into how he describes the relationship he has with Christ in his new life. But he comes back now and it says, Luke, in verse 3, now as he went on his way, Damascus was around 136 miles from Jerusalem. It was around a six-day journey by foot. And, and so Saul would have had a caravan because it's hard to, to chain people up and bring them back. So you probably need a couple people with you, right? I mean, I'm, I'm just anticipating. I've not actually been a part of that. But in verse 3, it says, now, as he went on his way, he approached Damascus. He is a man on mission now. He has the authority in his hands to go. He's on the hunt. And he is, he is hungry to bring these followers of Jesus back to Jerusalem for justice. And now as he went on his way, approaching Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. And we know the story, but I want to look at three 
Three things that Luke brings out, because I think it invites us to look deep into the character of who Saul was. And I think we can find a lot of familiarity as we walk through our own hearts with the Holy Spirit. Listen to this. Now, as he went on his way, he approached Damascus. And suddenly this light from heaven shone round about him and falling to the ground, he heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city and you will be told what you are to do. You'll be told what you are to do. So, so this is the first time in Saul's effort to bring resistance to the kingdom of God coming through Jesus that has stopped him flat. He was on a winning streak, and he got hit, and now he's face down on the mat. Imagine the silence rippling beyond that caravan, seeing this happen. And Saul down, hears the voice. Jesus initiates the conversation. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And I love what is happening here, because this is, this is what we refer to as a crisis moment. It's a moment where this is a major fork in the road. Saul is never going to be able to walk away from this confrontation the same. He's going to be changed, regardless if he draws closer to Christ or continues to resist. But in this moment, Jesus speaks to him, why are you persecuting me? Our gospel witness as faithful as it goes into people's lives, will never take the place of that crisis moment where the spirit breaks it into the mind and the heart. Our job is to be faithful, to declare and demonstrate, but we can never forget, and we need to be reminded of this, otherwise we'll drink from the cup of failure over and over and over, that it is the timing of God to speak life into that witness, and he'll do it right on time. It may not be the way we want it, but again, our expectation of what God's kingdom will look like, we have to be willing to let go in order for Jesus to be Jesus and to bring it in his way, his place, his time. There's revelation that's happened. Saul is down and he has an awareness that Jesus is actually alive. And he's talking to him and he knows his name. Now, the second part, the second part, and I, when I, I want to recognize too, what Saul was doing to believers he was doing to Jesus. And that's important to remember too. Every, Jesus knows what we suffer and he receives it unto himself personally. When someone rebukes us for living for Christ, persecutes us, they're doing it to him. And they'll answer to him. That's what's so important to know him as savior. Why we preach to know him as savior before he comes back as portrayed in the book of Revelation. Because that's the same Jesus There's revelation. The second one is conviction. Look what he said, Paul or Saul now. He said, who are you, Lord? He said to him, I'm Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Now, in the King James, it says, it's hard for you to kick against the pricks. Where does that come from? Why am I bringing that up? Because Paul, as he recounts this testimony in Acts 26, will say, Jesus said to him, I am Jesus, and it is hard for you to kick against the goats. G-O-A-D-S. What that is, it's a long stick pointed that's meant to poke and prod cattle in certain directions. And when you resist against it, it cuts into you. It hurts. And see, I'm bringing this here because it did happen here. Paul says later on that that was also part of the conversation. And I think it opens up to see the work that the Spirit is doing. While we don't see what God is doing in people's lives, Paul is resisting. And I think where his hate for believers comes from when you read his letters came from the fact that the spirit would break into his heart in certain moments to where he would start to see. And I think that disgust, that fear, is what drove him to act in hate all the more. Did you ever notice that? That sometimes when we see what disgusts us and other people and ourselves, we tend to take it out on other people. And that's what he was doing. And I think the Spirit had been working in his life so much that there was a point, not only did he hate Christians, but he also hated himself. And, and, and I think he was being swallowed up in this. I think his dissent that God was allowing him to go down was necessary so that he could know the height of grace that none of the other apostles would have been able to attain to. To share with Gentiles who were very far away from God. But listen to what Paul says in 1 Timothy. When he writes, he says, I thank him who has given me strength, who Christ Jesus our Lord, 
because he judged me faithful, appointed me to his service, though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, and insolent opponent. But I received mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. I was outside of that relationship with God. And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me in the faith and love that are in Christ. And say, this saying is trustworthy and deserves full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost or chief. But I received mercy for this reason, that in me as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. So everything that Saul was allowed to descend into, what Saul was sovereignly allowed of God to accomplish, was so that through the work that he would do in Saul's life, others would be encouraged to draw closer to Jesus. That if God can be merciful and do this in Saul's life, none of us are outside of that reach and that grip. And, and again, looking at it from the church's perspective that are suffering, to see God's value on Saul would be very hard, right? And to trust that Saul being allowed to do all these things is in God's sovereign control, and it's going to work to a good, and it's going to help others draw closer to Jesus. It's hard. It's hard to trust. It's hard to trust. And when he says it's hard for you to kick against the goats, God didn't let up, and his spirit didn't let up. What, what was those goats? How was the Holy Spirit doing that? By every person that would not deny Jesus at the expense of their life in the presence of Saul. To have such kingdom heart, strip away your job, your finances, your family, and you're still going to declare that Jesus is enough? See, that must have eaten him up. You can't break somebody who is not a resident in the kingdom that you have authority over. Nothing in this world can break us because we are not of this world. We are of God's kingdom. And if they crack us, just like what happened to Jesus, grace flows out. And this world doesn't understand that. And it gets angry and frustrated at that. How can you continue to show love? How can you continue to show grace? That's what Jesus is saying, that this peace is not going to be found in this world. When this world persecutes us and breaks us and grace and mercy flow out, it doesn't make sense. And so this is what's happening now. Saul is coming to this reality of who Jesus is. And there's no more restraint. There's nothing that he can appeal to in his own strength. The enemy isn't there to help him. He can't cry out for what was his source of strength. It flees at the presence of God. And now Saul is there surrendered to this reality of who Jesus is. And, and Jesus now says, here's the next step. Rise up and continue to Damascus. Go. And from that moment forward, Saul hit the bottom, and now the Lord was going to lead him step by step forward into the new creation that he was making him to be, this new creation. So Saul, what does he do? He says, no, Lord, I'm not. I'm resisting. No, he got up. Verse 8. Now notice verse 7. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing nothing. Very significant, right? They, they, they hear a voice, but they don't see anything. Very similar language to God talking with Moses in, in the mountain of Sinai, giving the law. But regardless, these men know something has happened, and they assist Paul. Now, this Paul who was going to, to, to bring wrath is now being led by grace. Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were open, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him where? Damascus. And for three days he was without, without sight and neither ate nor drank. What was he doing through these three days? Fasting. He was praying, and the text is going to say receiving a vision from God. God was talking to him. He is now no longer a child of his kingdom. He's a child of God's kingdom. And he's learning this voice that he heard is a continuing conversation now. And the text is going to show that God has been speaking to him through these three days of fasting. But now Luke wants to draw our attention because just because this is what God's doing in Saul's life, we have a tendency to zero in. God is still much more at work in other lives as well. And now he's going to bring two narratives together here. And he says now, there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. The second time Ananias appears in Scripture, right? First time, he lied to the Holy Spirit, he and his wife, and they died, right? Now we have another Ananias who's at the other end, who is faithfully living in obedience and yes and surrender to Jesus. This Ananias, the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, 
Who is that? No, look what it says. What does it say in your Bibles? Here am I. He's had conversations with Jesus before. And that's what I love about this vision that he's having. And with the early believers, the relationship that they had with Christ, they were talking to God. The Spirit of God was speaking. Jesus said, my Spirit that I sent will bear the witness of all truth. Everything that I receive, he brings to you. This conversation happening is normal in his walk with God. And, and so he, here am I, Lord. And he said to him, rise up to the street called Straight and at the house of Judas. Look for a man of Tarsus named Saul, for behold, he is praying. That's where I got the praying, but there's more. And he has seen in a vision, vision from who? The devil? No, oh, come on now. He's a part of a new kingdom. A vision from Christ the spirit is bringing into his life. He has seen a vision. A man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. So now Ananias is being invited into this. And now he's not, he's not a fool. Word travels fast. Look what Ananias says. Ananias answered, Lord, I've heard from many. How? He just got the authority to come to Damascus. How did a six-day journey that I'm sure Saul wasted no time so that he could get the element of surprise, did word travel that quickly to get to them? Rumors were always fly faster than the feet of those who are bringing out the plans and the purposes. And, and Ananias said, Lord, I've heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. Just in case, God, you weren't aware of this. This is who he is. Yeah, I mean, I guess today's a good day to die, God. But I was kind of hoping that Ananias is believed to have been a elder, a, a pastor, a leading presence of the way of Jesus in, in, in people's lives here in Damascus. And not only that, God was telling him to go to the street called Straight, which was the very public very noisy, very busy, main road, Roman road through Damascus. So not only do you want me to go to Paul, Saul, you want me to do this in public. God, do you understand what you're asking of me? But the Lord said to him, go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles, the kings, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed. And what, I, what God is doing here, it's just like the servant who had his eyes open to see the angelic realm against the resistance of the enemy of this world. We sometimes will get a vision of what God intends to do. We don't always get that. And we're invited, though, to trust him and to obey him. But when he does give that vision, it's so nice. And, and, and so Ananias has a little bit more faith and confidence. And I love that God gave Ananias his vision because God is a good father, knows when enough is enough, knows how to push just in the right ways. And we can trust his heavenly surgical hands in our heart and our life. If it seems like the circumstances are too hard, we're about to break. No, you're not. Trust God. Say yes and allow him to be God. And that's what he's doing with Ananias. Ananias, I hear you. This is what I have given him a vision. This is the plans that I have for him. And what he's doing, he's inviting Ananias to see beyond Saul's past. Are you willing, Ananias, to forgive what I have forgiven? See, this relationship, Paul was going to experience forgiveness. He was starting to experience it, but it's one thing to experience forgiveness from God and another thing to experience forgiveness from his children. Ananias is being invited to be the first that would extend forgiveness. So Ananias goes. Ananias departed and entered the house and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, Brother Saul, in this intimacy, he walks in like his savior, touching the leper, looking in the eyes of the woman, the outcast. He goes in to this man who had been humbled by God, broken by God. He doesn't go in and leverage, well, praise God, I'm sorry, brother, but you deserve this. There, was, there had to be conflict in his heart. I mean, look in the mirror. Look in the mirror, the conflict that we wrestle with giving people forgiveness or refusing to extend forgiveness, right? He goes in and he puts his hand on him. Brother Saul. Brother, 
The Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you came, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and he regained his sight. Then he rose and he was baptized and he started taking food and he was strengthened. What happened in this moment is just like looking at the cross, understanding the fullness of what forgiveness continually looks like for us. For, the, for Saul, he was allowed of God to sovereignly descend into the depths of where his hate would lead him down to the depths of what his sin could accomplish in and through his life and when he hit the bottom jesus takes his hand and leads him back up and as paul transcends into the heights of god's grace it's always parallel with the depth that he had and you'll read in his in his letters the value and the importance and the constantly going back to grace and forgiveness because he needed to remind himself that he was forgiven it is so central for who we are to be a kingdom people that we understand that we're first receiving god's forgiveness and that we're extending forgiveness in people's lives saul his the scales fell from his eyes he regained his sight and saul now has not only received forgiveness from jesus he has received it from his brother in faith ananias we are all sinners saved by grace. How can you say that you love God and hate your brother? The love of God does not abide in you. It's not there. And Ananias is bringing forth through the strength of the Spirit of God what is inside of him. God put his strength, and the filling of the Spirit brings it out. What Paul, being filled with the Spirit, is bringing out the reality of who Jesus is in his life now. And he goes, first thing he wants to do, he publicly, this very public road, this very public demonstration of embracing this man as a brother. Paul now wants to be baptized and publicly declare Jesus is the way. Jesus is Lord. Look what happens here. For some days he was with the disciples. Who? Ananias? No, others. Not only did Ananias first extend forgiveness, Ananias led Paul into the areas of brothers and sisters, leading, hey, vouching for him, putting his reputation on him so that Saul could be received and know the love of the community that he was persecuting. To know the love that comes through forgiveness by people you hunted. And, and we looked at this and we'll look at it later on. But not only did Paul hunt them down, he put them in prisons, he divided them up, and he forced them to blasphemy. And when they refused, he would make up the charge so that they could suffer and die. That's how ugly it got. And to be able to be received in love, that will never be found in this world. That's God's kingdom, God's peace. We are redeemed through Jesus. That means we have been freed from one kingdom into another, but not just redeemed, reconciled. That means not only are we brought from the kingdom of this world into the kingdom of heaven, but we are now friends with God, children of God, in that kind of a relationship. That's what defines the kingdom. And Paul is now learning that. It's totally different than what life was for him. And what does he do? Immediately. He proclaimed Jesus in the synagogues, saying he is the Son of God. There's one more passage I want to read to close on. But this is so incredible, but it's an invitation to believe this for every single person that's in our life. Paul would describe the depth of sin and the height of grace so perfectly in this passage in Philippians. And I want to read this. Philippians chapter 3, verse 4. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also, if anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. I was circumcised on the eighth day. I, the people of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to law and Pharisee, as to zeal, I persecuted the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. What Paul's saying is if it came down to a list of qualifications that were by the book of this world, man, I'm there. But even with all those accomplishments, he was not a part of God's kingdom because there's only one way to step from this kingdom into that. And stepping through that renounces everything of this. <clears throat> but whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss 
because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish or dung in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteous from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection of the dead. And in, in, in that, you hear Paul saying that, yes, I'm saved by grace. Yes, I am forgiven. Yes, I am redeemed. Yes, I'm reconciled. We can know those truths. But to be embracing them and living by them in our heart is a daily struggle. And his hope is to attain. He knows theologically he'll attain. But keeping his heart lassoed in to believe and to love every step of the way towards that is a daily effort. Not that I have already obtained this or that I'm already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Jesus Christ has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way. And if any of you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Here we have a man that was on a journey with the intention of the ruler in the kingdom of this world, and he meets the ultimate sovereign God over all. No heart is outside of his grip. And when God takes that heart of stone and puts in a heart of flesh, he is no longer a part of this kingdom, no longer a part of the rhythm and the efforts to bring persecution, but now he knows a strength that is even greater than his hate, grace. And it fuels him to face incredible odds and oppositions in serving and making Jesus known. What does that mean for us today? What does it look like for us? How are we to be inspired from this passage? I think a lot of ways, but the ways that I want us to zero in on, Ananias had to ask himself some really hard questions. Would he take God's strength to see behind Saul's past? Do we take God's strength even to see beyond our own past? Would he take God's strength to extend forgiveness for all that he has done? Would he, Ananias, love Saul as a brother in Christ? And would he do it publicly on the main road to Damascus? See, it's one thing to say we love, but to sit down publicly and break bread and do life together in all of the ups and downs, to weep when those are weeping, to love and celebrate when those are celebrating, to love the outcast, to sacrificially be a part of the lives of orphan, widows, and fatherless, to keep our hand in God's when his kingdom coming doesn't look the way that we may have wanted through an election, when his kingdom coming doesn't look the way we necessarily wanted when it comes to quarantine measures, to continue to trust his kingdom coming and our invitation to participate looks nothing like the way that we had hoped, planned, or anticipated. Are we still willing to say yes and to go where he leads, trusting that he is at work and not a single heart that beats in this world is outside of his redemptive power and authority.